Welcome back, guys. We're going to be talking about geologic time today. This is a short little lecture, but it deals with some important concepts that answers the question of how we know what we know. One of the major questions is, how old is, say, a dinosaur bone? How old is a rock? How old is a geologic event? The way that we figure that out is going to be told right here in this uh, little lecture. So uh, hang in there. It's about 30 slides long, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. By the way, we're just looking at kind of the penultimate in how we figure out geologic time, the Grand Canyon, right? This is the inner gorge of the Grand Canyon, and we can see a whole lot of rock layers in here. Uh, the layers, of course, you can even see here in the rock. We see layers within the layers, within the layers, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of time being reflected here. And of course, the time not only to pile the sediment up and to turn it into rock through the process of diagenesis, but also of creating a canyon that then exposes that rock for us. It takes a tremendous amount of time to be able to do this. How do we know? You're going to see how we know that now. All right, so we need to establish some basic principles uh, as we go forward, right? Uh, one of the things that we need to come up with is how we measure this time. And usually we think of it in terms of minutes and seconds and hours. and That's in our day-to-day -day human life scales. Uh, but in the geologic time scale, we're dealing with a lot longer periods of time than minutes. We're dealing with periods of time that could be millions of years, right? Um, billions of years in some cases. So if that's the case, we need something a little different. So we need a time scale. Well, rocks, the, so let's talk about the importance of a time scale. Rocks record geologic and evolutionary changes throughout Earth's history. Without a time perspective, these events have very little meaning, right? So if it happened 6,000 years ago, or if it happened six million years ago, uh, we, we need to know the difference. Otherwise, we could really get messed up in our conclusions. Uh, so there's two ways that we could do this, right? We can uh, state things in numerical and relative dates. Um, so numerical dates specify the number of years that have passed since an event happened. It's an actual number, right? The limestone is 250 million years old. That's an actual number that we can apply to it. Uh, by contrast, uh, we have relative dates, right? Relative dates place rocks in a sequence of formation. So the hermit shale is older than the Coconino sandstone. Uh, we do this all the time, right? It's one thing to say that if you're, say, 20 years old and um, your little brother is 15 years old, those are absolute dates, right? There's a five-year difference between the two of you. Uh, but if you just say he's my little brother or my younger brother, um, then we don't really know what the age difference is between you. We can glean that if we look at you, maybe we can get some idea, but we really don't know how old or that age gap is, right? Unless we have that information. All right, so you get the idea, right? The relative dates versus numerical dates or absolute dates. Um, of course, uh, one of the most important principles that we need to start off with is the principle of superposition. It's almost too commonsensical to really go over, but it is, in fact, important to talk about because everything else kind of builds off of this. So in an undeformed sequence, you know, a series of layers of sedimentary rocks, each bed, each rock layer is older than the one above and younger than the one below. So provided that there's been no problems going on during the deposition of rocks, the oldest one's going to be the oldest, or the bottom one's going to be the oldest, and the top one's going to be the youngest. That's the principle. And uh, this principle also applies to surface features like lava flows and beds of ash. So you're not going to get a, a lava flow that's going to creep underneath other lava flows, generally speaking. They're going to pile on top of one another so that the youngest one is on top and the oldest one is on the bottom. Same thing with ash when it falls out of the sky. And so here we see this uh, kind of illustrated in this, uh, in this diagram here. Here we see this uh, scientist looking at lake deposits. Uh, the obvious... Uh, thing that we get out of this is the, the, the lake deposits do not appear to be uh, deformed in any way, They're nice and flat, and so we can apply the, you know, principle of superposition and surmise that the older is going to be on the bottom and the younger is going to be on top. That's the idea. Okay. Now there's some other principles we need to bring up. The principle of original horizontality. So layers of sediment are generally deposited in a horizontal position. That means flat line. Okay, rock layers that have, or I'm sorry, rock layers that are that are flat have not been disturbed. Right. So here we see on the Colorado Plateau, we see these rock layers, nice and flat, 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 everywhere throughout here. 
Here we see in these Ordovician rocks, the same thing. Nice, flat layers, right? not deformed, not disturbed. The principle of lateral continuity. Right? Beds originate as continuous layers that extend in all directions until they eventually thin or grade out in a different sediment type. And we can see that here, right? Rocks that are on one side of this little gully are probably the same rocks that are on this side of the gully. It just ex extends across, right? They probably they were continuous at one point. There wasn't originally this gap here. Okay. And we can see this demonstrated here. This is lateral continuity. Is that originally there was a rock layer that extended across the valley here. And uh, when this uh, valley building event, whether it be glaciers or rivers, uh, carved this valley out, it left it on one side. But at one point, it was continuous. That's the principle that you need to get in mind. Right? And a matter of fact, down here, it's still relatively continuous, except for this part up here on the top. All right. Another really cool principle, and these are really, really neat in geology to find, are cross-cutting relationships. This is where something cuts across an older feature, something that is young. Um, so here we see uh, a bunch of layers. You can see the layers here. And cutting across it is a dike. And notice that the dike is not going in the rock layers. It's cutting across. And so the question you have to ask yourself then is, what is older? Is the dike older or is the rock layers older? And of course, the answer is obvious. It's, it's, the rock layers are clearly older. The dike has been intruded, and it's younger, right? It's, you, you, you are intruding something that is cross-cutting, cross something that is flat. This is undeformed and probably came in this way. This came in much later. Okay. Uh, inclusions. Inclusions are fragments of one rock unit that are in, uh, enclosed within another rock unit. So here we see, this, in this case, this is an igneous rock. We see a rock, right? But the intrusion or the, the rock that's stuck inside of it is actually younger. And this is pretty common that we find bits of rock stuck in other rocks. As a matter of fact, that's what sandstone does, right? Sandstones and conglomerates and breaches, they're little pieces of rock that are older that are now in a much younger rock, say a sandstone. And in this case, we see a bigger clasp, a big piece of rock that's stuck in, a, uh, in another one. And this happens where, uh, say, a volcano is erupting, and during the process of erupting, it grabs, uh, or the lava is moving up, is grabs off a piece of the uh, country rock, or the sidewall rock, and takes it up with it into the uh, volcanic eruption. And then we find it up here on the surface. Okay, that's uh, kind of a normal way you get an intrusion. So in this case, the rock containing the inclusion is younger. So here's younger. This, of course, has to be older. Right? This has to exist before it can be a part of this rock. That's the idea. All right, um, another, these are really, really neat. Um, in here in Hawaii, where I'm recording right now, we see a lot of these types of things, these features over here. These are called angular unconformities. We're going to come to these here in a moment. So layers of rock that have been deposited without interruption are called conformable layers. In other words, where things just continuously happen and change, it's all conformable, right? There's, it's a continuous recording of time. But an unconformity is a break in the rock record produced by non-deposition and erosion of rock units. In other words, a period of time where, or, or a location where, for whatever reason, that deposition stops, right? The layers just stop forming. They might take a break for a while and then form again. But it's a, basically a period in geologic history of lost time, right, where we don't see that record anymore. And sometimes maybe uh, you might have layers being deposited, you get some type of tectonic event like a fold that gets all eroded off so it destroys everything off the top and then it starts to pile more stuff on top of it again. That, that's one way you get an unconformity. So there are ba three basic types. So an angular unconformity is just tilted rocks that are overlain by flat lying rocks and that's what this is here. So here we see some nice angular or, or rocks that are at an angle right here. Some erosion has happened along its edge. And since then, these this new layers have been, or these new layers have been uh, deposited across the top, and those have been tilted even uh, there in that outcrop. Okay, so other than an angular unconformity, we can go to a disconformity. A disconformity is simply sedimentary strata on either side of an unconformity. You should say an an unconformity, and they're parallel, right? They're going to be parallel. In other words. You have a layer that's put down, there's a period of missing time, and then all of a sudden more comes in again. Right? So there's just a period of missing time and everything's parallel, nice and flat. 
Um, and nonconformity is sedimentary strata overlaying metamorphic or igneous rocks, right? So in other words, when the igneous rock is made, um, it's not recording fossils or anything like that. As a matter of fact, uh, igneous rocks destroy fossils. And then for whatever reason, they might get beveled off into a nice flat surface and you get sedimentary layers put on top of it. Um, that's when you get the real recording of real time, almost like that ta tape recorder. Um, the difference between that igneous rock and that sedimentary rock is called a nonconformity. So here's an example of how you would create an angular nonconformity, right? You get deposition, uh, deformation, uh, you get erosion where you basically chomp off the top of this, uh, these rock layers, and then you renew the deposition. You get these angles over here, and so you get an angular relationship right in here. And there's different ways that you can work out a hypothetical region knowing this information, right? So here we have maybe we go out and we map it or we get seismic data and we see uh, the land that looks like this. And what we could do is we could work back, uh, the way this wor works here is actually working towards creating this, but you can work back also, right, and figure out what happened by using the cross-cutting relationships and we can figure out something. For example, we know that um, K has to be much, much younger than A, and we know that the dike had to be younger than both A, than A, B, C, D, and E. Okay, there's a lot of different things that we could put together. And so there's an interpretation, right? We got some layers that were put in, maybe in an oceanic environment. Um, so this would be the law of superposition. Um, from there, we can uh, intrude a sill. So this would be the sill right here. The cool thing about a sill is that we can date that. We'll talk about how we can do that later on. Uh, we know that sill D is younger than beds C and E because of the inclusions of the sill of, uh, I'm sorry, the sill of fragments from beds C and E. And so in other words, we have a bit of E in D. That's what we see there. That's the law of inclusions, right? So next is the intrusion of dike F. So we see another dike come in here. So this is what they believe the landscape would have looked at some time. And we know that because it cuts across everything else, right? And then at some point, this had to be eroded and tilted, right? So probably, well, of course, the, you, the tilting had to uh, uh, probably happen at the same time as the erosion. So this gets tilted and eroded. This all gets beveled off. It's nice and flat. And then all of a sudden, we get new layers being deposited again. Maybe the ocean comes back. That's what the interpretation they have here. We get G, H, I, J, K all being deposited. And we wind up with this kind of landscape eventually uh, that we are trying to now interpret, right? So this would be a hypothetical region. This isn't of a real location. So anyway, you get the idea. Um, take some time, maybe pause this slide and uh, see if you can work through it yourself. These things are nice little puzzles that you can work through and they're pretty normal uh, homework assignments in a lot of geology classes to work out the geologic history using these laws that I've been covering. Another really neat thing to know about the geologic past is the evidence of past life. The evidence of past life is usually within the rocks, and if we know something about the evidence of the past life, we can use it to date rocks. So fossils are traces or remains of prehistoric life preserved in rocks. So here's, a, for example, a fossil. This is a fossil frog. It's 52 million years old, and you can tell pretty quickly it's a frog. It looks very similar to what we see today. There are differences. Uh, we're not going to get into the differences here, but, you know, this is a frog. It's 52 million years old. Um, and this is the, the kind of the science, and some people would say the art, but the science of going through and studying these fossils and interpreting what these creatures look like and how they lived is a study of paleontology. So knowing the nature of life that existed at a particular time helps researchers understand past environmental conditions. Obviously, wherever this creature lived, it's a frog, it's an amphibian, it had to live near water, that gives us clues and insights as to what was going on in that environment that created this fossil. There's different ways that we can fossilize material. Um, there's, um, we can basically go and make a petrified material here. This is a petrified wood. It's called permineralization. Uh, mineral rich groundwater flows through porous tissue and precipitates minerals. So you get petrified wood. Uh, for example, it might get covered by an ash. There's a bunch of minerals that gets deposited in the water. Usually it's quartz um, or, or something similar to this. And it winds up 
you precipitate it into the tissue and it replaces it. This is actually, even though it looks like wood, there's almost no wood here. This is actually um, a fossil that has taken the place of the original tree. But you can see that we got the structures. In some cases, we can even get the cells. Uh, a, little inf a little bit of information about the cells by looking at these, uh, these things. Really, really neat. Uh, molds and casts. Uh, mold is created when a shell is buried and then dissolved by underground water. So you, you, you bury it into the ground, and basically the, the thing disappears. But the hole that is left is the mold, right? And you can have other things precipitate inside there. You can have quartz, you can have uh, calcium carbonate, all kinds of different things form and replace what was inside that hole. And that's uh, called a mold. So a cast is created when the hollow spaces of a mold are filled, right? So here we, here we see a mold right here. And here we see a cast where it's filling it in. This is really, really cool. This is actually busted off, but uh, the original fossil is gone. This is the imprint that it left. This is the mold that it left into the rock. And then the other side basically took on that shape. And we can study this creature's uh, features uh, even though the creature itself is not present. Um, there's carbonization and impressions. This is probably the best way that we know about uh, ancient plants and certain smaller life. So carbonization happens when an organism is buried, right? Uh, followed by compression, which squeezes out gases and liquids, leaving a thin film of carbon. Basically the same processes that make coal. Um, except for the fact that instead of making coal, it goes to a process where it preserves nicely the leaves, and we can see that. And in fact, in coal, we frequently do find uh, carb carbonization and impressions of leaves uh, in the coal deposits. Um, so it's effective at preserving leaves and delicate animals. So we also get some uh, information of the, on the chemistry of the carbon that tells us information about those things. And there's a lot of interesting technology that is looking at the carbon molecules and their arrangements to figure out information about these fossils, especially very, very ancient fossils at the beginning of uh, kind of life's history on Earth. And of course, the impressions remain in the rock when the fit carbon film is lost. And so here we see a, a clear reptile impression of a lizard of some sort. This is, uh, I believe, dates back to the time of the uh, Jurassic. Um, but you get the idea, right? This is just carbon. The actual animal is gone. Just the carbon molecules remain. Okay, uh, probably the most famous of all fossils uh, in the last 20 years are the amber fossils made famous by the film Jurassic Park. And so I decided to go ahead and put a piece of, of amber in here. So amber is the hardened resin of ancient trees, right? It's this tree sap. And it's effective at preserving insects. Really, really good. In this case here we see a, a Jurassic insect in amber. Uh, really, really neat. You can get pieces of amber that have dozens of insects in it, and you can study them. Uh, there's also trace fossils, which is indirect, right? So here we actually see the creature. This is a Jurassic insect. This is, a, you know, maybe 100 million years old, or maybe older, um, sitting here uh, preserved. This insect no longer exists on planet Earth, but here it is in the amber. Uh, so anyways, back to trace fossils. Indirect evidence of, uh, indirect evidence of prehistoric life includes tracks, burrows, coprolites, and gastroliths. So tracks, here we see a paleontologist. He believes that this is actually a T-Rex track. And he gives the odds at better than 50-50 that this is a juvenile T-Rex that was walking through here and left this track. Uh, this would have been at some point six, before 65 million years ago. Uh, coprolite, uh, it is exactly what you think it is, just by looking at it. It is, uh, it is dino dew, <laughs> the best way I can put it. The best coprolites we find actually are, are probably small reptiles that left them. And we could use them to figure out information about their diets. Um, so it's a coprolite. Burrows, right? We, they left holes everywhere they went. We can actually go and look at these burrows. And sometimes we can find interesting things in them. And gastroliths are rocks that a lot of dinosaurs and uh, reptilian cousins of theirs would ingest into their digestive tract to help with the uh, breaking down of, of uh, different materials, um, especially if it was plant materials they were eating. Uh, it would help them grind it up in, uh, kind of in their gizzard, if you will. So there's certain conditions that, that favor preservation, right? Most organisms are not preserved. There's only a few that really are. 
First off, you need rapid burial and the possession of hard parts to increase the chances of preservation. Another thing that is really helpful is if you wind up getting deposited or you die in an area where your body falls into a zone where there's no oxygen. If you don't have any oxygen, there's nothing there that can live to eat you, and so your body gets preserved in the, sand, in the sediment. So here we see two creatures that have died. Uh, these are both dinosaurs, relatively small ones, but dinosaurs nonetheless. And they've fallen into this, uh, into this sedimentary deposit uh, right next to each other. Really good details, right? You can see the ribs, the spinal cord, the whole thing. Uh, long necks. Um, you can even see the small, intricate details of, the, of their hands and feet. Um, they have hard parts, so it's kind of like everything you need to make sure that you get a good uh, preservation. And this, of course, is some kind of silt or sandstone or uh, probably a siltstone. And silts tend to deposit readily and all the time. And so, yeah, you get everything you need to be able to deposit these two guys. All right. So that allows us to do some interesting things, right? If we're finding rocks in one place that have certain fossils in it, we can correlate it with rocks that we find in another place. So that allows us to date rocks even further. So for example, here we can go in the Grand Canyon. We know what the fossils look like. And we can go over here to Zion. Zion is right here. Then we can go to Bryce Canyon. And we notice that these things stack up nicely. We can look at Bryce and this is what it looks like. It turns out these two Formations down here, uh, the Navajo sandstone in particular, correlate very nicely over into the area that we see under Zion. We can go through Zion, through the Kayenta, all the way down into the Kaibab uh, in the Monkopi uh, Formation. Uh, these two correlate from Zion National Park into the Grand Canyon. And so as a consequence, we get a very large section of sedimentary rocks that we can correlate across this entire region. What's really cool is we actually have dates on these. Right, so we know from the Grand Canyon what these ages are, all the way up to the Paleogene, which is the youngest period of time that we see expressed in these rocks. Really cool. So correlation provides a more comprehensive view of the rock record, something really big. Uh, by the way, going from the bottom here all the way to the top is something that geologists refer to as the grand staircase, because you're basically walking up these rock layers as you go across from Grand Canyon through Zion to Bryce Canyon National Park. All right, so there's also the core. So this would be broad correlations, right, from all the way across the, you know, northern Arizona all the way up into Utah. Uh, we can correlate other things, right? And the best way of doing this, uh, well, there's several ways we can do this, right? Especially in limited areas. Sometimes they don't extend across, right? You get a lake in one place, you get a lake in another place, and you don't really know if they're correlatable through environment or whatever. One of the best ways of doing this is to note the position of uh, fossils and to look at the rock strata. So let's read this here. Often accomplished by noting the position of the bed in a sequence of strata, right? So we get an idea of whether they're all about the same age. Uh, involves matching of rocks of similar ages from different regions. And to correlate over larger areas, fossils are used for correlation. This is the key. And so if we're looking at different, say, ocean basins worldwide, it turns out there's certain fossils that are present at different times that allow us to correlate different areas. For example, if we're finding, uh, oh, I don't know, um, this fossil here during the Permian period and this fossil here during the Permian period, and we find it all over the place, we know that they're at least time correlative. They, they, they correlate in terms of time. And so that allows us to be able to know that these were both happening at about the same time. So fossils are really big. So the principle of fossil succession is really important. Uh, Things that are really, really simple begin evolving right into the Cambrian. We find really nice things called trilobites, which no longer exist, but they were worldwide along the coastlines back then. And uh, we find things all the way up in the quaternary period, such as human beings, right, uh, that tell us that these things are of quaternary age. So, for example, we get these things called the age of trilobites, the age of fishes, the, which, uh, the age of reptiles, the age of mammals. The age of mammals is the time we live in now. And so if we're finding large mammals, we know we're in the age of mammals. If we're finding dinosaurs, we're in the age of reptiles. So if we're finding uh, the large fishes and the, and the trilobites, we know where we are in that succession. So index fossils and fossil assemblages. So index fossils are widespread geographically and limited to a short period of geologic time. And that's what this is up here. These are basically the main index fossils. If you find something, for example, this fossil here, 
and we find this fossil here, we know that they're, cor they're correlated time-wise, and they probably lived at the same time or very, very close to the same time during the Cambrian period. All right. So that's, <coughs> I know I'm kind of throwing out a lot of jargon, but let's, let's just show how this works, right? It's kind of better to just show how it works, and you'll get it. So index fossils and fossil assemblages. So we have a, a rock, right? Here's a rock unit B, here's a rock unit A, and we want to know its age, right? Well, we know that the one on top is younger and the one on below is older, but we have some evidence. We have some fossils in here, and we can use it to look at the different indexes that are in there, right? So a fossil assemblage is a group of fossils used to determine a rock's age. So here we got some plants, some leaves, here's a dinosaur, a scallop, a starfish, and we can go in there, and or sea star, I'm sorry, that's what the uh, oceanographers like to call it, age of rock unit A has all of these in here. So we know when these things lived. We know that there's, here we see the scallop, here we see this, what well, is probably a fern, the dinosaur here, here's a leaf, and we find the star, and we find, in this case, do we find this here? I'm looking for it. Uh, it. It's not present up here, but that doesn't mean that it has to be, right? Because these other ones exist. And what we do is we find out where they all lived at the same time. So this lived during this period of time, this lived during this period of time, this lived during this pink period of time. You, you'll notice that it can't be any older than that because if it was any older, we wouldn't find this leaf anymore. That leaf right here, it only exists during this period of time. So this is one bracket. The dinosaur here had the T-Rex head. Uh, had to be uh, in this time. So we know that it had to exist during this pink period of time. Same thing is true down here, right? We find the starfish, but instead of uh, finding the, uh, the leaf, right, instead we find the trilobite. So we know that the trilobite lived only up to this point, and this leaf only lived down to this point. So this is the only thing that matches all of the data that we see there. And that allows us to get an age relative on, the, uh, on this. So this might be Cambrian, whereas this up here might be um, belonging to the age of mammals, or I'm sorry, to the age of reptiles, because there's a dinosaur in it. So fossils can be used to infer information about past environments. All right, so this is kind of almost so obvious, right? Shells can be, uh, shells of organisms can be used to infer positions of ancient shorelines and seawater temperatures, even just on the first order, right? If you're finding a T-Rex head, you're not in the deep ocean. If you're finding, um, scallops, you're probably somewhere near the coastline. If you're finding ferns, you're probably in some type of marshy environment or coastal environment, uh, uh, things like this, right? You're, you're not going to expect to find a, a bunch of vulture bones and fossils in the middle of the ocean, right? That's the environmental indicators. All right, so we kind of got the idea that there's these animals that live at different times and they kind of evolved uh, in, into different times, at different times, I should say. Um, so how do we put dates to it then? The answer is, is that we figured out how to do this using radioactivity. That's the main way that we do it. Um, I wish there was a more sophisticated way, but this is probably 98% of the ways that we do our absolute dating. We get a real number and say how old something is. It's using radioactivity. So radioactivity is the spontaneous decay in the structure of an atom's nucleus. We actually talked about um, the structure of the atom at a much earlier lecture on the, uh, on the principles of matter and how it operates. And if you have any need to go back, you should go back, find that lecture, and review that before we go ahead uh, if you don't remember the structure of the atom. So I'm going to assume that you still have that freshly, you know, fresh in your mind or that you have some fresh experience with it, and we're going to continue. So the types of radioactive decay, there's several, okay? The alpha emission, so in other words, the, 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 the decay in that structure of the nucleus, we can see an alpha emission, which is an alpha particle. So two protons and two neutrons are ejected from the atom, just come out. And so what happens is the mass number is reduced by four and the atomic number is lowered by two, right? Because we have two protons that are lost in the process, but we add the number of neutrons and protons that tells us the atomic mass. So the thing gets lighter by four and the, and the element changes by two down on the periodic table. So beta emission is a little different. So this is where an electron is simply ejected from the nucleus. And this usually happens at the expense of a neutron. 
So we lose an electron by shooting it out of the nucleus, usually from a neutron. So the mass number remains unchanged, right? It doesn't really change. But the atomic number is increased by one. Why? Because that neutron, by virtue of shooting out the electron, becomes a proton. Right? Remember, go, you know, if you, this is confusing to you, please go back and review that lecture. And lastly, electron capture. An electron is captured into the nucleus. So this is where it's absorbed. It's the exact opposite of the beta emission. It's the electron capture. So in this case, a proton takes on uh, an electron. It fuses and it becomes a neutron. So the mass number will still remain the same. It's not going to change, but the atomic number will be decreased by one. Why? Because the proton is now a neutron. And uh, anyways, just we have uh, the mineral uranite here. Uh, this is a uh, a primary uranium ore, and uranium is one of the lead elements that we use to date um, ancient rocks. So here we see this uh, kind of exhibited directly. This is a nuclear reactor. Uh, we see the kind of the glowing of the light is due to the, uh, the emissions going through the water. There's water here, and it's making the water glow blue. It's kind of cool. So anyways, here we see this unstable parent. Basically, we have a proton, neutron, situation here and we just take part of it and we just shoot it out and that's going to change the nucleus it's going to become one atom to a different kind of atom this is actually a helium atom that's uh, emitted uh, and the beta emission the neutron here shoots out an electron and it becomes a proton so that changes the nucleus again to something different so it becomes a different element and the same thing here right the electron comes in it combines with the proton becomes a neutron and we wind up with a new nucleus again. So these are the different kinds of radioactive decay that we can experience. Okay. Now the, the really cool thing about this process in radioactive decay is that it happens at a statistically predictable rate, right? The amount of decay that will happen. So radioactive, radiometric dating is completely dependent upon this idea. So it uses the decay of isotopes in rocks to calculate the age of that rock or of that rock. And so we wind up with something called a half-life. A half-life is the amount of time required for half of the radioactive isotope to decay. So we might have 100 atoms in this case, and over some period of time, we're gonna wind up with 50. So we can put a dot right there, and that's our first half-life. Now the second half-life is kind of cool because that 50 is a second half-life away. So it's the same amount of time when we go from 50 to 25. So it doesn't go from 100 to 50 to zero. That 50 becomes 25, and then it goes half again. That 25 becomes 13. That 13 becomes six. That six is gonna become three. That three is gonna become one and a half, and so on and so forth. And of course, the number of daughter atoms that we're going to be accumulating while we do this also goes up by the same amount, right? So one is forming at the expense of the other. So the daughter atoms are, are accumulating while the parent atoms are being destroyed. So radioactive parent isotopes decay to stable daughter isotopes. That's the idea. When the ratio of parent to daughter is one to one, one half life is passed. So if we're looking at something that originally had 100 atoms of, say, uranium, and now it only has 25 atoms of uranium and maybe 75 atoms of a, of a daughter material, mainly lead is the main thing, um, then we know that two half lives have gone by. And so we can just have to figure out how old the rock is. That's the idea. So with each passing half-life, 50% of the remaining parent decays to another atom, which is what we just discussed. As the parent atoms decrease, the daughter atoms increase. So the one goes up, the other one goes down. Several natural, naturally occurring radioactive isotopes are useful for dating rocks. And we're going to talk about those. One of the main ones that we're going to be talking about, or kind of briefly bring up, is potassium to argon. This is a really useful one. It's common. Potassium uh, decays into argon in case bar and potassium feldspar. This is one of the most common rocks in continents. It's found in a lot of sandstones, and it's a really hard rock, and it stands up to weathering very well, or mineral, I should say. Um, so this is really kind of cool. Um, it has a half-life of 1.3 billion years, so that's kind of not that, you know, in terms of Earth history, it's about 25% of Earth history is the half-life. So that means that it has some good resolution to go beyond that. As long as we have several half-lives in, we can go three or four half-lives, and we can figure out how old these minerals are. Uh, it can also date rocks as young as 100,000 years. So it can go the other way, right? It can go very, very young as well. This is a really cool process. It's, it's, uh, there's some other ones, right? Potassium-40 uh, decays to argon-40. 
and calcium for you. See both of these. And argon is a gas and only present in rocks as the daughter product of the decay of potassium. So essentially what we see here is, is that we can go through, I can say, hit this with a laser at some special place uh, right on the crystal where I know I have a good crystal. Uh, I hit it with a laser, I blast it, and I measure the amount of argon that comes out of it. And I know that that argon had to have come from potassium because potassium feldspar doesn't use argon to form. Potassium feldspar makes, you know, uses potassium. It's through the radioactive process, it's through the decay process that argon is produced long after the mineral is formed, so it's trapped in that mineral. And so we're able to go through and measure the amount of argon that we find in this rock, and that allows us to get that nice date. This is a really cool technique. So anyways, here we see potassium feldspar up here. Here's some other ones. Uh, uranium-238. This is a common uranium. It's the most common one to lead-206. This is the common decay, stable daughter product. It takes about 4.5 billion years. So it's actually pretty stable. Uh, radioactivity in uranium-238 is fairly low. Um, when we compare that to other things, it's, it's, it's not too bad. Uh, uranium-235, which is really famous because this is the variety that is used in nuclear weapons, uh, it decays to lead 207, and that takes um, a shorter period of time, seven, 704 million years. Uh, thorium-232 to lead 208, 14.1 billion years. This is almost as the age of the, uh, of the universe, right? As we know, the Big Bang was about 13.7. Uh, rubidium to strontium, look at this one, 47 billion years is the half-life. That's longer than the accepted age of the, of the universe by far. Right. Th even this is older than that. So we have the ability to look at information way back in geologic time. Okay. Uh, this, this is not always a straightforward process, right? I'm talking about you know uranium-238 going to lead-206. It turns out that uranium-238 to lead-206 is actually 14 steps, right? It goes uranium to thorium, back to uranium, you know, thorium, radium, uh, radon, polonium, lead, Right, polonium again, lead, polonium, and then back to another isotope of lead. So it goes from lead 214 to 210 to 206. It's a 14 step process if I was to go through all of these things. So it can be a little complicated, right? You're going to find these other things in your rock too. And this could actually be helpful. And a lot of uh, geologists are now looking at decay ratios in rocks uh, between 238 and, say, radon 222 or radium 226. Um, but the, by far the best for dating the rock itself is 206. This is, uh, you, some of these uh, isotopes up here are useful for figuring out other bits of information, such as uplift rates or how fast rocks cool off, things like that. All right, I'm kind of digressing on that, but you get the idea. This is not always a real simple thing. Okay. Um, there are other isotopes uh, that we can use. Um, I'm not going to get into them. We'll, we'll talk about carbon, uh, either this lecture or next, um, carbon-14, which is used for dating uh, things in the modern era. Um, but there's, sor there's all kinds of sources of air, right? The system must be closed, right? You can't have a bunch of fresh argon flushing through your potassium argon uh, crystal, or you get all kinds of mistakes, right? No et external addition or loss of parent or daughter isotopes. So fresh water is a, I'm sorry, groundwater is a real problem. Uh, if it's flowing through rocks, it can cause things to change. Fresh unweathered rocks are ideal for use, uh, to use for radiometric dating for that purpose. So Earth's oldest rocks are found on the continent. Right, All continents have rocks that exceed 3.5 billion years, uh, whether it be Greenland, Canada, uh, South America, whatever. You go to any of the major continents, you're going to find at least a portion of it somewhere that's 3.5 billion years old. So the continents are quite old, at least the starts of them, the very hearts. And it confirms that geologic time is immense, very, very old. The Earth, we, as we've discussed, is over 4 billion years old, 4 and a half, you know, 4.6, 4.55 billion years and individual minerals have been dated to 4.4 billion years. We have never found anything older than that. Um, we, as we've said before, and I've said many times, we assume the Earth to be about 4.55. So this is about 100 million years after the creation of the Earth, maybe four, less than 200 million years for sure. We have found individual minerals, and this is where we find them, a place called the Jack Hills in Australia. 
where we have uh, sandstones that contain zircon crystals that date to about 4.4 billion years old. That's right after the formation of the Earth. We find zircons. Really, really neat. Oh, here it is, actually. I wasn't sure if it was in this slide or the next one. Um, but anyways, we're going to talk about carbon-14. So carbon-14 is really cool. It's used in archaeology. It's used in very young uh, geologic studies, um, or, or to say young rock or young processes geologic studies. Um, so radiocarbon dating uses the radioactive isotope carbon-14. Uh, Half-life is 5,730 years. That can be used to date events as old as 70,000 years, right? Beyond 70,000 years, there's so little carbon-14 left that we don't see it anymore. So essentially, this is, the, this is the chemistry. C14 is produced in the upper atmosphere from cosmic ray bombardment. So we have, uh, basically, here's nitrogen-14, which is pretty common. Uh, there's some neutron capture that happens, so basically a neutron comes in and it pushes out a proton, so a proton emission, and we've got, wound up with a carbon-14. It's radioactive. This is radioactive carbon-14. So the carbon-14 is absorbed by plants through photosynthesis. Why? Because carbon-14, just like carbon-12 and carbon-13, has the same chemistry. The plant doesn't know the difference, and it just takes it in. So C14 is only useful in dating organic matter as a consequence, right? We have to have plants or wood or something like that in there. We, you know, rocks don't absorb carbon-14. And all organisms contain a small amount of C14, including you. You know, you're, you're watching this little lecture right now, and yeah, you're breathing in C14 into the carbon, or, you know, or you're consuming plants that have absorbed C14. And so as long as you're alive, you're consuming new C14, you're, you're keeping that reservoir of C14 uh, up to date. It's when you die that everything starts to break down and you're not consuming any, any more C14. So your radiometric clock is started at that point when you're dying. So that's the cool thing about C14 is it, it doesn't necessarily measure when you were born, but it does tell you <laughs> when you died. All right, so we can now put together what we think of or, or, or what we see as the geologic time scale. So the geologic time scale encompasses all of Earth history, everything. There's a lot of stuff to, in it. Um, I wish I could go through each each part of it. This is actually a bigger, there's a larger class that deals with the geologic time scale called historical geology. We talked about that in lecture number one, that there were two branches of geology, the physical, which is the course that you've been taking, and the historical geology, which is the course that uh, is usually taken by people who have a deeper uh, desire to learn more geology. Um, and they learn the geologic time scale and what happened throughout Earth history as they go through it. But let's go through this really quickly. So it subdivides geologic history into units and originally created using relative dates. We didn't have the radiometric dates until much, much later. So this is the generalized one. Is there's a period of time called the Phanerozoic, which is the period of time in which we live. And this is the youngest eon. And below it was a period of time called the Precambrian. Precambrian is subdivided into the Proterozoic and the Archean, and we'll be talking about that in a future, actually in the next lecture, in detail. What we know most about the history of Earth is in the Phanerozoic, and the reason why is because this is where we have the fossils, right? Visible fossils are, are present in rocks from during the period of the Phanerozoic, and so we can use fossil succession to figure out everything. We've got the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, the Cenozoic, and these can all be subdivided into different groups, the Permian, most famous of which is the Jurassic or the Triassic and the Cretaceous, all right in here in the middle of the Mesozoic. Um, putting all this stuff together has taken several lifetimes and a lot of hard work, okay, to be able to put dates to the actual time scale. So the structure of the time scale uh, we've kind of been going over this really quickly, and Eon represents the greatest expanse of time. This is an Eon here. The Phanerozoic Eon is the most recent Eon, which began about 542 million years ago. All right? The Phanerozoic Eon has the Paleozoic, which stands for ancient life, the Mesozoic, which means middle life. This is also known as the age of the dinosaurs, and the Cenozoic era, which is recent life, also known as the age of mammals. So this would be the uh, basically ancient life, middle life or dinosaurs, and Cenozoic is the period of time of the mammals. When you look at all of Earth history, that's not very long. It's a very, very small period of time right up here at the top, Cenozoic. 
Now, if we even break up the Cenozoic, we realize that human beings, which have dominated the Earth during the period of time of the Holocene, is really just a very small sliver of time in the general view of what's going on, the Holocene being only the last 10,000 years. Um, Pleistocene going all the way back 2.6 million years ago, we find evidence of hominids populating the Earth all the way into the Pliocene in Africa. So humans uh, and their origins really are only major players in Earth history in the last 5 million years and really agents of major worldwide change in the last 10,000. It's extraordinary how much effect we've had during that period of time. During the rest of this, we've seen dinosaurs and meteor impacts and all kinds of different things happen, major um, uh, extinctions, right? Six extinctions that have happened that have almost wiped life out. Um, and we're just kind of sitting there right at the right at the very edge up here during the Holocene. So anyways, uh, just some quick notes here. The each, Phan each Phanerozoic era is divided into periods. So here we see the Phanerozoic, and here are the eras here, and here are the periods. Right? This is what it's talking about. So here we've got the Quaternary and the Tertiary. And the Tertiary in Europe is usually split up into the Neogene and to the Paleogene. But you get the idea. Uh, the Paleozoic era has seven periods. Right Here we see the seven periods here, the Cambrian, the Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, if you live in Europe, in the United States, we split it into Mississippian and Pennsylvanian, and the Permian. Okay. Um, most epics are termed early, middle, and late. So we could even say early Cambrian, late Cambrian, middle Cambrian, uh, late Pennsylvanian, that kind of thing. We don't normally do that up here with the Cenozoic, and even with the Mesozoic, we usually resist doing that somewhat. But we do that frequently with the Paleozoic, and the reason why we do it is because the periods of time that are here are very, very large, right? The Permian is lasting a period of, oh, roughly 50 million years. But 50 million years is as big as the entire Cenozoic, almost, right? The Cenozoic being 65 million years, so it's 15 million years longer. Um, the uh, Devonian, of course, is well over the period of time of the Cenozoic. So this is, this is just a huge period of time. So most detail in the geologic time scales of the Phanerozoic era, right? That's where we have all the fossils. That's what allows us to break it all open. Uh, the, the four billion years prior to the Cambrian period are divided into two eons. This is actually where we know the least history of the Earth. Um, this is a real problem for us as geologists and, and kind of the keepers and interpreters of Earth history. Um, there's a couple of reasons why, and we'll go into this here momentarily. Um, so it's divided into two yons and often collectively referred to as the Precambrian, everything before the Cambrian, right? The Cambrian is the beginning of the Paleozoic here. So everything below the Cambrian is the Precambrian. That's what this all is. Okay. And during these period of times during the Proterozoic, which means before life, uh, it was called that because all of a sudden when we get into the Paleozoic, we start seeing fossils. We start finding shells and teeth. But before that, we find nothing, right? Almost nothing. And so people believe that there was nothing here. Now they know that, in fact, there had been life all throughout this period of time. It just took us a long time to find those fossils because they didn't have the hard parts, right? They didn't have the fossil or the, 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 the bones and the teeth and whatever it is that we now find in most of our Phanerozoic fossils up here. These things were all soft-bodied. Um, and, of course, the Archean is the period of ancient time, the Neoarchean, the Mesoarchean, the Paleoarchean, and the Eoarchean all part of the Archean period of time. Very, very ancient. And less is known about Earth further back in geologic time. Why? Because plate tectonic processes in the rock cycle destroy old evidence. If there was any fossils, there, most of them are destroyed. We get lucky from time to time. We find some evidence. But for the most part, uh, you know, you have uh, plates run into each other. And you get metamorphism, and the metamorphism destroys the, uh, the evidence of, of any life. And so it's very difficult to date these things and to put together these stories. So it was during the Precambrian, simple life forms that lacked a hard part, algae, bacteria, worms, fungi, dominated. You know, the first abundant fossil evidence does not appear until the beginning of the Cambrian. We just talked about that. And many Precambrian rocks are highly deformed metamorphic rocks. There's, there's just nothing to find in them. So the evidence is very scant. Okay. But that doesn't mean that we can't put some of these principles to work to be able to figure out some of these problems. So, for example, here we see a canyon 
the top of it of which is the Wasatch Formation, down below is the Somerville Formation. We have a bunch of rocks in sequence in between. We can put together a really cool um, kind of sequence of events that have happened here because we know that we have uh, uh, minerals, a volcanic ash bed, that's going to have potassium argon in it, and we can go through and we can date that. And in this case, they've said, oh, it's 160 million years old. And we know that it's, that means everything above it is younger than 160 million, everything below it is older than 160 million years old. And then we find an igneous dike that is intruded here, but it doesn't intrude the Wasatch Formation, right? It's clearly younger than Wasatch because it doesn't cut across it. And that's at 66 million years old. So the Wasatch Formation has to be of the Paleogene age because the Paleogene started 66 million years old. Okay, The Mesa Verde Formation, the Mancos, the Dakota, all of these things, we know what these, where these should fit in, and these should be of Cretaceous age. The Jurassic Age rocks, the Morrison, the Somerville, we know where those are as well. Okay, You get the idea. And so the Mesa Verde Formation, we can assume that these also exist over here. Why? Because we can assume original horizontality and that these things were continual, right? There was continuity between uh, or across these, these units here. We see continuity here. We can assume continuity here. And we can assume continuity here, here, and then as well as that pink over to the Wasatch as well. So we're able to put together a whole process that since the uplift of the Wasatch, we've had the erosion and deep incision by some type of river system into the valley. All right. So I know a lot of information, uh, dating sedimentary strata and being able to figure these things out because obviously if we have fossils in here that helps, but that doesn't allow us to get a real date, right? We can bracket it between a couple of known areas and be able to get some good dates. We know that, for example, all of these had to have formed based on fossil evidence during the Cretaceous and this during the Jurassic. But the exact dates might be somewhat difficult to put down other than to say it's between 66 and 160 million years old. All right. Okay, so uh, <laughs> a lot of information, a lot of chemistry, uh, basically calling upon you to uh, remember some of our earlier lectures, and I hope that you have. Um, if you have any questions, as always, send me an email uh, or find me on a message board. So hope to hear from you. Um, if you have any questions, feel free. Okay, until next time.